morning, Bluebell. Can I get a good morning from you? Good morning. Man, you guys are quiet. You guys are supposed to be what, Generation Z or Millennial? Let's hear that again. Good morning, Bluebell. Good morning. I don't think that was loud enough. So I'm going to say good morning, Bluebell. And you guys are going to say good morning, Aminga. Okay, so the count of three. One, two, three. Good morning, As you guys can see and you've demonstrated, I have a lot of energy. So my name is Aminka Velvet. I do a lot of things in life. Um, some of the most important things, I'm a social and tech entrepreneur. I run a foundation to empower young women and girls. I run a tech company and just I'm a regular person in the world trying to live a sustainable world and create more equitable communities. Right? Cool? Okay, they can clap when you want. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. So I do a lot of speaking engagements in Canada and throughout the world and workshops. And before I go further into my content and the conversation we're going to have today, I always collect some statements of consent. I believe in consent. It's an agreement between two people or two individuals or groups that you are agreeing to what you're going to experience. So. I'm going to get some statements of consent from you all today, and if you agree, just say, I agree. Cool? Okay. So I am going to be open today to explore new ideas, new thoughts, and new perspectives. If you agree, say, I agree. Okay. So the second statement of consent. I agree to listen to my others who are next to me and hold space for them should they be triggered in this experience we're going to have today. If you agree, say, I agree. Okay, so let's get this started. So today I've been asked to talk about leadership. Does anyone know what the term leadership means? Raise your hand. Some of you guys do, a few, maybe, no? Okay, that's okay. If that's why I'm here, right, to have this conversation. So we're gonna talk about leadership today. What does that mean? What does it mean, as you see my talk says, developing your divine potential. I believe that every person in the world and their abilities that they have can be a leader. I feel that sometimes our systematic institutions marginalize individuals and place what type of leader they can and cannot be. I am a defined leader. I feel that I'm a born leader, but I wasn't always this person that you see today. I had a personal journey that you all have that you're going on right now. What I'm gonna to do today is talk about my personal journey, what traits of leadership that you could use in your life, whatever you choose to do in the world, and how you can make your mark on the world. In 10 years, it's gonna be 2030. Think about that, 2030, the existence of humanity. Something has to change, something magical has to happen, and it's gonna come from you. You are the generation that's going to fight climate change. You are the generation that's going to figure out the best form of artificial intelligence. You are the generation that's going to finally serve world hunger, right? So you must have all the abilities to do that, right? Okay, let's get started. Next slide, please. So as we talked about becoming a leader, what's important, how I became a leader, I have to own my own story. And what does that mean? What does your story come from? For some people, it's where you were born, what you look like, what's your ethnicity, your religion, your physical body, your abilities, what you do or do not have. For others, it's what has happened to you and how you have handled that to transform something you're going to do in the world or how you interact with the world. So it's important as we talk about, you heard today, microaggressions, Black History Month and leadership, to know your own story. Yes, I'm visibly a black woman. My pronouns are he, are she, and her. And regardless of how I identify, you still have your own story. And today, we're not talking about necessarily if you're black, that's your story. Everyone has a story. And the importance is how do you come to control that narrative so you can create more sustainable communities for others? 
it's important that if you're like me, if you're a black woman, if you're not a black woman, to understand the power you have in creating space for people like me as a black woman, somebody who belongs to the LGBTQIAA community, or someone that belongs to another community, what your actions and how you navigate through that world, how that can hinder or help someone's experiences. So we all have the ability to create sustainable communities, but it starts with knowing your story. Who are you? What experiences have you had in your life? Are you adopted? Or do you come from a single family home, a two parent home, an interracial family like I come from? Those shape our experiences and how we interact the world. And it's important that you take back that narrative. When I was growing up, over to the next slide, please. I'll show you guys an embarrassing picture of me. Look at that, look at those big cheeks, right? And that little, and the big mouth. It's okay, I grew up, I grew up okay. I think I did. Um, but yeah, so I was a little baby. I was born in Jamaica. I am Jamaican. Any Jamaicans in the house tonight? No, a few, okay. Um, so you can tell, lots of energy, right? I was born in Jamaica and my parents weren't married when, when I was born and conceived. My mother did get married to a Canadian, a white man, and we moved to Canada when I was five years old. Growing up here in Kitchener, Waterloo, about 20, 25 years ago, um, it wasn't as diverse and inclusive as it is right now. It was very different. So what I experienced, again, going to the narrative and your story, people just assume things about me with, without even knowing who I was. Raise your hand if anyone has assumed something about you without knowing who you were beforehand. Right? Now look around. We're not the only one, right? And raise your hand if that frustrated you and if that makes you feel sad and uncomfortable. Right? So I had to go through my first five years, first years in Kitchener, Waterloo, as an immigrant, as a black girl, I came from another island, which they didn't know too much about, besides Bob Marley, that was it. And um, I had to discover my voice. I had to discover what was gonna work for me in my new country. Lots of times, because I was black, they assumed I didn't have a dad. Um, they assumed that my family consumed drugs. There was a lot of assumptions because of who I was as a black girl. So what I could have done is just kept that narrative and just said, well, they don't expect much from me because I'm a black girl, I'm not going to do well, my family's gonna be on welfare, and I'm gonna not graduate high school. But what I decided to do was to own my own narrative. What that means is that my story, your story, does not belong to anyone else but yourself. Meaning that you get to decide if you want to be a kind person, a compassionate person, if you're going to be a good reader, if you're going to be good at math, or if you're going to be athletic. That's what's owning your story. So I had a journey to go through and find that. So why was it a little bit difficult? Down here. I was energetic, as you can see. I was outspoken. If you told me something and I didn't think it was right, I would question you and I would ask. And there's nothing wrong with that. Lots of times what we find in society as women is that our voices are always quiet. Our voices are always minimized at the expense of men and boys. And I felt that when I was speaking up, it was always like, be quiet. So here I am, this black girl, loud, talking, all I hear is stop talking. You're always talking, Amika, shut up, Amika, stop talking. All the time, on my, on my report cards, it always be, excels very well, but needs to learn how to be quiet. And that's always frustrating because now I'm being told in school, it's okay to be smart, but you're not to talk too much. You're not to ask questions. And the interesting thing is, it's the opposite in life. You are to ask questions. You are to explore. You are to be critical. And you are to think, yes, your teachers are educated, but you as a learner have to accept yourself and own responsibility in your learning. Is this all that there is? Is there more? How do I form my own opinion? So this is what I went through as, as a student. And I was always taught that I wouldn't be a good leader because, oh, she has an attitude. She needs to be reformed. And I said to myself, no, I might not be the physical leader that you think is. I have a darker skin. Back then, I was always wearing corner rolls. But I'm going to show you that I have just as much leadership skills as anyone else does. Because you know what? A leader is not a color, it's not a gender, and it's not an ethnicity. It's a character trait. And I was determined to tap into that leadership skills. Next slide, please. 
So I kind of did a little bit when I was in high school. I got really into, I heard you guys talked about DECA. I did DECA. I got into politics. I did model UN, model first minister's meeting. And I even made the local paper. Look at that. The girl they thought couldn't be a leader was in the paper talking about potential politicians of the future. And then when I finished high school, and let's be honest, high school is very difficult to go through. Raise your hand if you're having a hard time in high school. Let's be honest. Okay, turn around, turn around, turn around. And those who didn't raise your hand, it's okay. It's a safe space. You can admit if you are having a hard time, it is okay. Well, I'll be honest with you today. High school was difficult for me, not academically. Again, I was very smart. I've always been a smart person. It was hard for me because I was navigating what is your story, Amika? What is going on? One minute I'm getting leadership awards, the next minute I'm not. Next minute, I'm having conflict with my teachers. The next minute, I'm not handing my papers. I was battling what the world was thinking of me and what I wanted for myself. And why I was having those issues, I didn't have a lot of teachers who looked like me. I have a few, one of them is here today, Ms. Smelly, and I had a few others that were black, but there weren't that many. And it was very difficult as a black person trying to find your voice in a space that doesn't resemble you. And that's my story. Your story might be that you love a certain hockey team and nobody supports that hockey team because of the city that you're in. And that might frustrate you. Or it might be that you are, you're battling your orientation and it's difficult for you to come out with your family. Everyone has different things that they're battling, but the most important thing is figure out what that is and how do you separate yourself from the negativity of the world. So what I had to do was realize, Amiko, what do you want in life? What is your vision for your life? What, is, what are the passions that you have? And how can you achieve those things? And what I realized and said to myself, I am a leader. I've always been a leader. I want to do something incredible in the world. I want my name to mean something. I want to give impact to others. So then I was like, all right, how do I get forward and how do I do that? Next slide, please. So like I said, I was into politics. I didn't finish high school. Um, got some academic awards, leadership awards, scholarship awards, and my dream guy was to work on Parliament Hill. Has anyone been to Ottawa here? Raise your hand. Oh, okay. Keep your hand up if you liked Ottawa. Was it, did you like it? Yes? No? Okay. It's very cold, right? It's a very cold city. I lived there for five long, cold years. And if that wasn't enough, I moved to Montreal, an even colder city for another long six years. But the point is, is that I wanted to work on politics. That was my dream, because I said to myself, I don't see a lot of black girls or black people in that space, and it meant so much to me if I could be in that space, because I was telling myself, if I was in that space and somehow that would validate my existence in Canada, somehow I would be just enough, and somehow I would be okay like the other girls, and, and, and everything that I experienced, and people not liking my hair, and my skin color, not believing I was smart, or whatever I went through, would be all erased because I was working in Parliament Hill, the, the, the highlight of Canada. As you can see here, I made it. I did that. I got through it. And this is, it's kind of blurry to see, but this is my past. Every time you go into Parliament Hill, you have to swipe your pass, show the security that you work there. Then you have to go through a couple lines of security, uh, metal detectors, and things like that. And then you go up. So I had a great time in Parliament Hill. But the story is not so much about Parliament Hill. What it's about is that. I was telling myself that I was going to succeed in someone else's definition of success. I was going to succeed and be okay and be happy in someone else's narrative of what I thought my story should be in developing my leadership skills. So I went to Parliament Hill, again I don't know if you can see, but pretty much my hair is shaved off, it's pretty low, there's no makeup, I don't know if you guys can see in the light, I have a full face of makeup on today. Ah. I have a cute outfit on, and why I mention these things is this is how I want to show up in the world. I want to show up pretty, I want to show up confident, and I want to show up with all of my personality because that's my talent. That's attached to the leader that I am, right? And I was having a difficult time creating my own narrative because I said to myself, if I go to parliament, everything's going to be okay, I'm going to achieve my dream. What ended up happening was part of that. And what that was is that I had to, I end up reducing who I was to fit into a space. This confident person you see today, this energetic woman you see today, 
quieting herself down to fit into a space in someone else's narrative because I didn't own my own story. And that is, I grew up low income. I grew up in an interracial family. Both my parents do not have over a high school education, but their kids went to university, their kids went to college, and their kids got scholarships. And it's okay that I can be in this space even though no one in my family has ever been. So I felt out of place. So what I did is that what made me unique, my personality, my love for color and fashion, I minimized that to fit in because I was creating someone else's story. Raise your hand, close your eyes, if you have ever done anything to fit in just to be cool. And keep your hand up if you're still trying to fit in to be cool. Okay. I guess all of you guys want to be cool or you're already cool. Okay, cool. Whatever the cool people, get to know. Uh, so what I learned again in this Sphinx in Parliament, what I want to tell you guys is you have to choose yourself, even in a world that doesn't choose you. If you find that you don't find anyone that looks like your body type, and you feel like you gotta be fit in, you feel like you have to have a struggle with food, and you have to go through that in silence, know that that's someone else's story. That doesn't have to be your story. Don't strip away what makes you who you are to fit into someone else. Let me say that again so we can all hear it. Don't strip away who you are to fit in to make someone else think that's who you are. Did you guys get that? Cool. Let's go to the next slide. So after I left Parliament Hill, I was trying to figure out what can I do that will make me happy professionally that I can add the skills that I've learned in university, in high school, and that would make me happy that I could show up as my full self. I could be, whoop, Amika's here, and you knew I was here, and you loved that I was here. How could I do that? And I stumbled on the tech industry. Such a weird thing, huh? I got this marketing job in, with a startup. I left um, working on Parliament Hill to work for an institute, studying like different world conflicts. And then I realized, hmm, this could be different. But then I found another issue when I was in the tech space. And if you guys heard about the tech industry, raise your hand if you guys have. Just a little bit. Few of you guys have heard about the tech industry? Okay, some teachers in the back. So think about it. The tech industry, what do you guys hear? Lots of men, right? Lots of white men, right? Not a lot of women. And if there's women, there's not a lot of color. So I got the job working at the startup here. You can see someone on the, on the, the tablet. It is a web-based platform to learn English and French as a second language, and it has an iOS app. So I was a business and marketing manager, and I experienced microaggressions. I remember I was taking uh, marketing classes in the England to, you know, up my abilities and want to be on top of my team. I was leading a team of eight professional front-end and back-end web developers, very, very smart people. And I felt inadequate. I felt like I had to be on top of my game. So I took some even classes. And comments I would hear from my team, oh, you actually go to school? Oh, you actually study? Oh, hmm, I didn't know a girl like you could do that. I heard it all the time. I would wear skirts purposely to work because I wanted to show up as myself, as the most feminine self I could to make people uncomfortable. So I would wear skirts, my makeup, appropriately dressed, of course. And you would hear comments about, ah, maybe this is not the industry for you. Mm. This is not like a fashion show. Why are you trying to be cute in tech? I would hear all of those comments, and I said to myself, man, I can't do politics. I can't do tech. What can I do when I can just be myself? Like, they tell you to go to school, get your education, but they don't tell you what happens in the workplace, that people are gonna tell you that you're not enough, and it's gonna make you uncomfortable. And I heard, you're too attractive to be in tech. No one's gonna fund your company looking like that. And then what I learned, again, we have to create our narratives, that's what we are learning, right? Is that I developed my entrepreneurial spirit. Any of you guys here in an entrepreneurship class? Raise your hand. Or anyone has heard the term entrepreneurship or entrepreneurs? Okay, anyone in here want to be an entrepreneur? Some of you, yes, maybe, good. Interesting enough, there were more boys than girls who put their hand up once being an entrepreneur. Ladies, you can do it. You can become an entrepreneur. And the thing is that 
There's nothing wrong with you guys being an entrepreneur. Become an entrepreneur. Like I say, we need solutions to climate change. We need solutions to what's going to happen when we have a social media buzz. But ladies, feel just as comfortable to own success. Feel just as comfortable to innovate, try, and fail. That's one thing that we don't tell girls enough. You can fail and be okay. Try it out. Men do it all the time. And men continue to fail, because women are gonna be there to help you clean it up. So, yeah, you like that one, huh? That's good. So what I learned is that, hmm, they're not liking how I dress, they're not liking how I am. Even though I brought the most money to the startup ever, I secured contracts with the school board that was never done in 10 years for this company. And I said to myself, yeah, you guys give me a round of applause. Thank you, thank you, so much. Thank you very much. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm an entrepreneur. Like, look what's happening to me. I can go out there, sell a product with a little bit of resources, have people believe in me, and make things happen on my own without a boss telling me what to do. I was like, how? Oh, what else can I do to become an entrepreneur? And I will tell you, my experience in tech and going to this industry changed my life. I never viewed myself as an entrepreneur. I viewed myself as a leader, but this was the moment that I tapped into my highest leadership capability. There's tiers in becoming a leader, and we'll go into talking about what those tiers are. You don't have to be an entrepreneur where you want to start your own business because, I mean, unless you have a lot of money up front, it can be a real struggle, let me tell you, it can. And, but what you can do is have the entrepreneurial spirit, meaning that if something doesn't exist where you are, in your school, in your university, in your home, your hockey team, I see some of you guys got your Rangers caps on, shut up Rangers, um, you can go ahead and go out and start it. An entrepreneurial spirit is saying that I'm not gonna wait around for an institution to create an idea that I think should really exist. It's in time with leadership. Becoming a leader and saying that, oh, no one knows how to sort the garbage on the compost, let me take initiative and start a recycling club. Oh, we don't have any halal options in the cafeteria, let me talk to the cafeteria person so we can have a halal. Oh, there's no prayer space for those who want to pray on Friday's afternoon, let me try to do that. It's taking that push that you hear yourself in your voice to say, let me try this out. And then you say a little bit louder, let me try this out. And then you hear, let me try this out, out loud. And then you say, oh, it actually worked. Well, redefining who you are by going beyond your limits. That's where you in this realm of euphoria. You guys heard of the word euphoria? Yes. Yeah, you have to say yeah, you're too quiet. Yes. Yes? Okay. It's like that incredible, like, a hot feeling, right? We you eat your favorite cupcake or your favorite, I don't know what you guys eat, grilled cheese sandwiches, and you're like, oh man, this feels so good. It's basically like that, yeah. Next slide, please. So one quote that I love that really keeps my mantra and everything that